Hello. I've lost the sound. It's okay. We're all muted. Uh, Linda, oh, God. You'll okay. Want, yeah, you'll just want to turn off your video and mute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Indigenous Lit, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple of notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time during the event by using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, M. Revac and Company, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Thanks to the American Indian and Indigenous Community Center at Virginia Tech for sharing information about this event. We also greatly appreciate the support of all festival sponsors, donors, and community partners. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Annette Sanuk Klaps Klapsaddle, author of Even As We Breathe, is the first enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians to publish a novel. She has served as executive director of the Cherokee Preservation Foundation and is an English teacher at Swain County High School, near where she was born and raised in Western North Carolina. Kelly Jo Ford, author of Crooked Hallelujah, is a debut author who is long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and a Publishers Weekly Best Fiction Books of 2020. She is- <laughs> She, she has work published or forthcoming in the Paris Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, the Missouri Review, and 40 Stories, New Writing for Harper Perennial, among other places. A citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, she lives in Virginia. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, Diane Wilson, author of The Seed Keeper, is a writer, speaker, and editor who has published two award-winning books, as well as essays in, a numer in numerous publications. She is the executive director for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And our moderator, Linda Lagarde Grover, is a professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth. She is the author of novels, essays, and poetry that have received the Flannery O'Connor and Minnesota Book Awards, as well as others. Thank you all for joining us today. Linda, take it away. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor. It's an honor to be here and to be with these with these three fine writers of, of recent novels. And thank you so much to the to the Festival of Books for having us here. And this is a very exciting panel that we have. And it will be a, a rich experience to to hear the writers talk about their work and their books and also to have some questions from other participants. And and um, we'll be speaking with each other, too. I love all three three of these books. It, is a, it was just a wonderful reading experience to read these contemporary books. And I love these. I love every single one of them. So we're going to begin here with um, Diane Wilson and her most recent work, The Seed Keepers. And um, please take it away, Diane. Ha matakiapi, ampetukinde iushkian wachi ankapia. 
Hello, all my relatives. It's good to see you here today. Uh, my name is Diane Wilson. I am a Bede Wakantuan Oyate descendant, and I am enrolled on the Sichangu Oyate Reservation. Uh, many thanks to Linda for the introduction and for hosting us, and especially to the Virginia, Virginia Festival of the Book for the invitation to be here. It's just an honor to be reading with Annette and Kelly Jo. Um, so the Seed Keeper was inspired by a true story that I first heard in uh, back in 2002 when I participated in the Dakota Commemorative March to honor the 1700 Dakota women and children who were removed from Minnesota after the 1862 Dakota War uh, because they had no idea where they were being sent or how they were how they would feed their families. They sowed their seeds into the hems of their skirts and hid them in their pockets. So even when families were starving, these women protected their seeds for the upcoming generation and for the next season when they had no idea how they would feed their families. So thanks to their courage and sacrifice, we still have Dakota corn to grow today. And in fact, I grow it in my own garden. And while I was working on this book, I also work in uh, nonprofit organizations working on food sovereignty issues. And I was blessed to spend time with elders who taught me that these seeds are our relatives and that they are our ancestors and they are sacred beings. Um, I also learned that our food is medicine, which is really important to understand. And that if you can control the food, you can control the people. So all of that is woven into the book. So the story is told through the voices of four Dakota women across several generations from 1862 to 2002. And the seeds themselves open the book with a poem that reminds us of our ancient agreement to take care of them in exchange for the gift of food. So throughout the book, the story moves around in time, alternating between the main character, Rosalie Ironwing, and the voices of her best friend, Gabby Makespeace, her great aunt, Darlene Killsdeer, and Marie Blackbird, who is Rosalie's great-great-grandmother, who was 14 at the time of the 1862 Dakota War. And as we follow the lives of these women, we're also following the story of the seeds until one day they disappear. So the story begins in, as Rosalie Ironwing is about to leave the farm where she's lived for 22 years to return to her childhood home on a Dakota reservation. After her father died when she was 12, she grew up in foster care believing she had no family. And Rosalie had no connection at all to seeds. When she marries a white farmer and learns to garden, she actually begins the journey that will ultimately reconnect her to her family, their legacy of seeds and her community. So the excerpt that I'm gonna read is the moment when Rosalie uh, meets her great aunt Darlene Killsdeer um, after years of believing she had no family. And this is not a spoiler because I, give, I tell you this right up front in the prologue. So um, it just gives you an idea of two of the characters it said in 2002, Darlene Killsdeer had just finished lunch when her nurse invited us into the apartment. Darlene's voice had sounded so frail on the phone that I was not sure what to expect. My throat was tight and my eyes burned with fatigue. I felt oddly numb. I couldn't wait to get this over with. Already, I regretted bringing my son Thomas with me. As I waited for the nurse to hang up our coats, I looked around at the faded carpet, the scuff marks on dingy white walls. Darlene's third floor window looked out at an elementary school. The apartment was less than 10 miles from where I had once lived on the other side of town. The living room was small with a television in one corner and two mismatched chairs for guests. A few steps into the room, I stopped abruptly stunned by the sight of tall corn stalks growing in buckets and cans set on yellowed newspapers, their edges curled and stained with mud. The floor was littered with brown leaves. 
From the curtain rod hung a dozen ears of blue and rose speckled corn neatly braided. On the ledge outside the window, I could see bits of bread and apple. I began to wonder if Darlene might be senile. As the nurse quietly stacked a tray with dishes, she nodded toward the two chairs. I moved a pile of folded laundry to the floor and sat down, Darlene next to me. Darlene was leaning back in a recliner with her eyes closed. An oxygen tank stood on the floor near her chair. A thin cloud of dark hair streaked heavily with gray fell around her shoulders, framing her thin face, her skin a translucent yellow. I knew her high cheekbones, the sharp ridge of her nose. Bony hands rested on the blanket that covered her lap, the two thin mounds of her legs. I set the damp package of nettles that I had gathered that morning on the table near Darlene's chair. As we waited for Darlene to open her eyes, we listened to the low murmur from the television as Bob Barker announced a new winner on The Price is Right. Thomas straightened the collar of his shirt and sat jiggling one foot, unable to keep still. A plaque on the shelf above the television named Darlene Killsdeer as Miss Indian Princess for 1939. A birch bark basket held a long braid of sweet grass. Inside a dusty frame was a photo of a child standing next to a much younger Darlene. They were posing in front of the cabin. The child was me. When I turned back, Darlene was awake. We studied each other. It is you, she said. You have your mother's eyes. When I introduced Thomas, he stood and extended his hand to her. She looked up at him and frowned. Turning to me, she said, Rosalie, why is your son in such a hurry? An awkward silence fell in the room. Then I felt a soft touch on my arm. Darlene leaned forward and patted my hand. You did the best you could, she said. You had no mother to learn from. Your father passed too soon. And they took you before any of us knew what had happened. That's how it was back then. They could just come and take your children. That's why, that, that's why. Darlene began to cough, raising a white handkerchief to her lips. The nurse came in with a glass of water and a pill. We waited while Darlene took her medicine. That's why I had to plant this corn, she continued with a weak smile. That's how I found you. Plants have their own way of talking. It's not the same here as in the garden, but it was something I could do. I could ask the plants for their help. I could ask the crow for his help. I could talk to the oak trees on the boulevard outside my apartment and ask them to watch for you. You must have been 12 when they took you. I pounded on desks and filled out paperwork and walked and walked, just hoping I would catch sight of you somewhere. Every time I walked past the school, I would stop and look at all the little girls running on the playground. Every time I climbed on a bus, I looked in the face of each child. I dreamed you at night, living somewhere behind a metal fence. Your face always turned toward the door. Year after year, we've kept this vigil. I promise to wait for you until my last breath. And now you're here. So the question that I ask throughout the Seed Keeper is about our relationship with seeds and the ways in which that relationship has changed over many generations and what that change means for us as human beings. And to quote Dakota activist and scholar Harley Eagle, the question I'm most interested in is how do we fall back in love with the earth, with our seeds? Pidamaya. Miigwech, Diane. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll hear from Kelly Ford, whose most recent book is uh, Crooked Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Linda. And um, that was beautiful and um, so inspiring, Diane. Uh, it's such a, an honor to be here with both of you and with Annette. So I just want to 
thank the Virginia Festival of the Book so much for um, this chance to come together in um, a little Zoom community for a few moments. It's um, it, it, it's really um, means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit to you from from Crooked Hallelujah. I guess I'll I'll talk about it a little bit first. Um, Crooked Hallelujah is is a novel in stories, so each each chapter should be able to to be read alone for its own. What I think of as a complete movement, um, but together each of those stories tells a bigger story. Um, and and the book follows Justine and Rini, who are a Cherokee mother and daughter. Uh, they move from northeastern Oklahoma is where the Cherokee Nation is, kind of in the the top corner there. Um, and they're Cher Justine and Rini are from from the bottom part of that um, nation. Um, but they move from from the Cherokee Nation to North Texas, um, looking to start a better life. But it it so happens that it's during the oil bust of the 1980s, so that life doesn't. Um, really look much like they imagine it might. Um, and, and that's, I guess, where, where, where fiction starts, we get trouble. Um, at its heart, I, I think that it's a story about mothers and daughters. And really, I've come to think of it as, as a love story um, of sorts between mothers and daughters. And I feel like so often we think of our, our love stories as, as romantic stories. And that's, that's what they, that's kind of the only way that, that we peg them in you know, wider society, but in my life, that's, that's not, um, that's not the case at all. And I think that's what this book is. Um, it's a story, really, it's not just about Justine and Rini, it's a story about four generations of women from this family. Um, and a harsh Christian fundamentalist upbringing follows the family. And I think that faith both saves some of the characters, and, and it also so breaks some of the characters, um, and, and kind of haunts them, I think. Um, and, and it also serves to isolate them from, from the world around them. Um, the book came about, um, I think, as a result of me following my obsessions, really. Um, I didn't set out to write this book. It, it, it felt like this, this book kind of came to me, and I, it was up to me to understand um, where it was calling me to go. Um, and, and now I, I realize I was trying to tell the story of place as much as people. And, and it's two places really, because it's you know a fictional town in the Cherokee Nation um, called Beulah Springs and a fictional town in North Texas called Bonita. Um, so it's that, and then it's a story of a family as well. So it was a big task. And um, my own story of writing the book, um, it took me almost 14 years um, to understand how to, that I was writing a book and to figure out how to tell the story and find my way through it because I started out um, just thinking that I was writing short stories and and very much wanting to to write the best short story that I could and then and I would work on it and work on it and I'd put it down and try to write another to the best of my ability and, and it turned out they were coming from the same places um, so I, I was a little bit slow to listen to 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 that I think. Um, but that's, I think, the how the story came to be. Um, I, I'll go ahead and read um, a bit. I might read a couple of shorter pieces, and um, I wasn't gonna gonna read this this section, but um, I mentioned that I, I've come to understand the the book as a, you know a love story between mothers and daughters, but also about grandmothers. Um, there's a line in the book. Um, where the youngest generation, I'll remember Rini, um, says that her great grandmother was her soulmate. And um, that's a line that very much comes to from my life. That's how I've thought of my great grandmother. Um, and I was sitting here thinking about what I was gonna read. And I, I have um, my great grandmother's, one of her journals here, I'll, I'll show it to you. And, and this journal, like just a kind of a random entry in it inspired a list that's in, in the short story. Um, it says 1974 on it, but it's, you know, through, through the years, she, it was her diary, 1977. You can see her, I don't know if you can see her handwriting there, but Cherokee was her first language. Um, and she used to write the sweetest letters um, and this diary is very sweet, but also it was just, it had lists in it. So this was the inspiration um, 
for this little, this is just a short piece that I'm going to read for you. It's called Annie May, and it's in the first, this might be the, the actually the second story in the book. July 23rd, 1982. I never can forget I got the news my poor lost grandson John Joseph passed when I was braiding my hair, fixing to walk to Dandy Dalton's to pay on my grocery bill. I already had my purse under my arm when Thorpe Rogers called on the telephone. I couldn't put any of the sounds he was making into words, but right, right off I knew. Thorpe Rogers preached on faith power in a special service the night before. Saints got to be sanctified, he said got to live good and right so lost little ones can see the light. He said it in his language and then he tried to make it right in Cherokee for me and the other old ones. Thorpe Rogers raised up his arms like a picture of good Lord's love. In heaven, he said, we shall reap our rewards. Then his face kind of broke in two and he said, but we got to get there, saints. We had a good long service, like the ones that used to set my soul to burn. But going home, I did not feel good. The Sequoia Hills, always sweet to me, look down like cold mountains. Even in the moonshine, even the moonshine on my arm felt like a stranger. Dear babies, Rena and Sheila, Sheila, by me in the back seat did not make me better. Maybe I knew, but only in my heart first. John Joseph was going cold right then. The boy never could stay out of trouble, even when he was a little one cracked his head diving in Bluff Hole, July 3rd, 1972. He could hear a song one time and play it all the way through, humming it out as he go. Didn't matter, he sold the electric guitar Thorpe Rogers gave him for $5 so he could buy up Dandy Dalton's candy. January 12th, 1969. I used, I used to back then put down things that happened in this night no, nice notebook that Lula gave me always put my thoughts in there as best as I could, just for me. John Joseph passed the day before his own birthday, the day before this country will ever call him a man. After that, after I put that down, I could not write another thing in here for a long time. The nice leather book was just ledger. I add up my charges for the month. Here's the direct quote. 39 cents shortcakes, 89 cents hairnets, three pounds Crisco, 210, 25 cents pop, 60 size, 66 cents liver loaf, $1 cash. I stay on my knees after altar call ends now, but I don't hardly pray. I look for pictures in the altar wood, try to make out long gone faces when I know I should lean hard on myself to get up and go back to my seat. I stay there so long the church goes still. I hear little ones rustling on pallets and sweet sister saints praying, thank you, Jesus. Thorpe Rogers and Lula start up again. They weep and moan with good Lord's love. My children so strong in their chests, that muscle can only be from good Lord. Cannot be me or their cowboy daddy with his drinking and Lord knows what else. I feel hands on me, skirts dance by and fan me cool. I know they pray this old woman is finally meeting the Holy Ghost, praying good like I should with fire. Truth is, all I pray is to be able to pray, maybe pray to be strong when I need to be this time. One night right before he passed, I woke to a broke front door and John Joseph asleep on the living room floor. He had 12 stitches sewed up over his eye drunk running around in Sequoia County and an argument over a girl got him hit with a tire iron. He opened his eyes to me standing over him. He looked scared for a minute, not of me. Then he came back. He stretched and poked his finger on the end of a thread holding him together. He said, she's so pretty, Granny. He could not pray either. I shushed him. Lula was still asleep with one of her spells. She would be in a bad way with John Joseph there smelling like beer joints and the screen door broke. Thorpe Rogers wouldn't let him come home from drinking no more already. I should have got on my knees and prayed, drag him by his hair and tell him you pray and tell my own self that the good Lord was listening and believe it down in my heart. But I thought to myself, I'll fix it. I put bologna on to fry and ca called my sister Celia in hominy. Celia married an Indian like she should, a big Osage man who spoke his own language and went to college, a man who kept his hands where he should. 
he would have work for John Joseph. I blackened the edges like John Joseph liked and handed him the phone. Celia said, nephew, you come stay with us, but you don't come home drinking. And he hung up. He tried to argue, but Lord, Lord, that boy listened to somebody finally. He went to Hominy and did not come home to Celia's not one night after he got there. He took up with some running around wild cousins and didn't come back ever. The demons know fire too. Maybe demons chased him so hard that he could not slow down until he stopped for good on the side of the road where he came to such terrible, awful rest after 18 years, almost 18 years. He told me before I sent him up to Hominy to die, Granny, them old boys and their tired iron, they ain't got nothing on me. You should have seen them, Granny, he said, and then he laughed and squinched up his busted eye and doubled over, black hair sticking all over everywhere, needing a haircut. John Joseph tried to fix the broke door with masking tape and a screwdriver before he left. That boy fiddled all morning with the flapping screen, singing Elvis Presley songs to me, never fixed it right. It's still stuck together with tape. It needs a new screen. And I told him so that morning. I told him so, and I sent him off to that highway in Hominy. I should have locked the door and never let him leave. Should have tried to scare him with the love of a good Lord. John Joseph probably knew better. That boy has a way right into my insides. He tapped a screen with a screwdriver and winked with his good eye. He grinned and said, I'll take care of it, Granny. I give nickels to pay on dollars I charge. I add up, take away, and nothing evens out. And I don't think it'll get fixed ever. I just as soon it stay that way. I see the tape and remember John Joseph holding a screwdriver and eating fried bologna. And I, I'm sorry, and eating fried bologna that I fed him grinning up at me, good eye and bad eye, trying to hide behind that greasy hair. I remember him like that. I try to, bent over but looking up. Just a warm boy still, saying he's sorry for the trouble, but he'll make it all right. And this old lady, I don't say nothing to him. I don't drag him down to pray, and I don't pick up the telephone to conspire him away to his death. I take that sweet running boy in my arms and I press my face in his wild hair and I hold on. And I think that that is my time. Thank you so much. Oh, many thanks, Kelly Jo. Um, next, we will um, we'll hear from Annette Sanuk Clapsaddle, her new, new book, Even As We Breathe. Thank you, Annette. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here um, and a little intimidated to read after <laughs> Diane and Kelly Joe, but uh, Linda, thank you for, for hosting us along with the Virginia uh, Festival of the Book. Um, it's just such a great event to be a part of. Uh, I am currently in Swain County, North Carolina. Um, where I teach school and I am from Cherokee, North Carolina. And part of the novel is set in Cherokee, North Carolina. And the other part of the novel, even as we breathe, um, is set in Asheville, North Carolina. And so today it takes me about an hour to get to Asheville, but the novel's set in 1942 and it would take about two hours to get um, between Asheville and Cherokee. So in um, the summer of 1942, the Grove Park Inn and Resort in Asheville held access diplomats as prisoners of war, four nationals and access diplomats as uh, prisoners of war just for that summer. And it created this, um, this odd situation where you have diplomats who are, are technically prisoners um, but their prison is an upper class resort in, in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Um, and it's also located so close um, to uh, the sovereign nation um, where the Eastern Band um, is located in Cherokee. So um, it was really this, this odd historical information that drove my interest in writing this narrative. Um, I you know, was familiar 
with internment camps being Japanese internment camps being set up on Indian reservations out west um, to some extent and um, have always been interested in questions of citizenship and um, how identity is rooted in place and how politics can change that at any given time. And so the real history of the Grove Park um, led me to this fictional story. Um, what's, um, I think, is kind of funny about um, even as we breathe is at no point in time when I was writing it, did I consider it historical fiction? <laughs> it is barely clearly historical fiction um, set entirely in 1942, but I was uh, far more interested in, um, in the commentary it has on current situations, on um, current questions we have in terms of citizenship and belonging and, um, and systems of prisons um, you know, on our land. So, um, so it, it took actually, I think, um, the publisher having me fill out a, a questionnaire about where this belonged <laughs> until I realized it was historical fiction. Um, but it is very much, I think Kelly Jo mentioned this is um, about her book. It's very much setting driven um, of time and place really pushed the book forward. So the protagonist, County Sequoia, is a 19 year old young man from Cherokee who goes to work at the Grove Park that summer uh, as a member of the grounds crew. And he's joined by another young woman, Cherokee woman um, named Essie. They don't know each other all that well before they leave for the Grove Park. Um, and he becomes very much interested in, in Essie for all kinds of reasons, but they develop a, a very significant um, friendship, uh, a relationship that it's kind of hard to define um, until the point that he is accused of being involved in the disappearance of a diplomat's daughter. And that, that certainly causes um, problems for County in all kinds of ways, in, including his relationship with Essie. Um, County goes back and forth between Cherokee and Asheville in the book. And while he's in Cherokee, we learn a little bit more about um, the complexities of his family. His father uh, was killed at the very end of World War I. His mother died shortly after giving birth to him. And so um, County was raised by his grandmother, Lishi, he refers to her as Lishi and a little bit by his uncle Bud, but you'll see in the section that I'm about to read, they have a pretty strained um, relationship. So um, I thought that I would um, start by reading um, really from chapter one, um, and I'm gonna cut it off and move um, into another chapter from there. So I won't read the, um, it won't be consecutive necessarily, the, the whole chapter, but, um, the the book itself, I was the concept of the book for me is very much divided into sections of bone, blood, and skin. And the reason being, um, I kept thinking about how we make so many determinations about identity based on those three very um, temporary aspects of of who, who a human are. And what is really important is um, that spirit um, of who we are. So um, the first section, uh, I included in the first chapter too, I included an epigraph um, from Tom Belt. He's a member of the Cherokee Nation. He's not Eastern Band, but he has lived in the Eastern Band um, community for much of his life, especially much of his later life, um, and is a good friend. We were walking into, I was in the middle of writing this book, and we were walking into a coffee shop in Cherokee, and Tom has a tendency to do this. He just says really wise things just out of the blue, and I'm like, oh, let me, let me write this down, um, but he had opened the door to the coffee shop, and I, I don't know how it came about, but he said to me, um, and this is uh, an epigraph in the book. That's the thing about ceremony. It must have three things. It must be for the right reason at the right time, and it must be in the right place. 
And that really, for me, helped to, to structure um, how I thought about the story that I was telling as, as if it is a ceremony when we tell a story. Um, so I'll start with chapter one. <clears throat> I don't remember the day my father died. I don't remember Lishi standing at the clothesline when the soldier came to tell her the news. I don't remember the way she nodded her graying head, turned, went back to pinning shirts and skirts, unable to cry for a long time. I don't remember how relieved Lishi was that his body under the circumstances would be returned when so many others were not. I don't remember my father's face cradled in the pine casket by one of Lishi's special quilts. I don't remember any of that. Barely four months old at the time, I couldn't have. I've constructed images from stories and pictures and stitched them into one of Lishi's quilts. I do not remember the paleness of the pine box as it was precariously lowered into the deep earthen hole. I do not remember preacher man sprinkling dry specks of red clay on top an act that later seemed terribly disrespectful to my six-year-old self when Lishi explained it to me at an aunt's funeral, an act that made me wonder if my father deserved such treatment. I don't remember preacher man announcing dust to dust, but he must have. Sometimes I think that I remember smells, but only when I smell them at new funerals. Grease, lilies, tobacco, vanilla, fresh dirt, pine sap. I remember one taste though. It must have been repeated so many times after that day that I've convinced myself of it. The bitterest salt I have ever tasted. Lishi's tear when she scooped me up and held me so tightly that my open lips smashed into her cheek. You were his, I remember her saying. You were mine, I am certain I remember her saying, even though all of this is surely impossible. I don't remember my uncle Bud or rather his shadow jutting from the doorway, but there has always been a shadow between him and me between him and my father. So it must have been there that day. I don't remember the many different scales of cries from many different throats. Gunshots surely rang, must have been 21, three from seven men. I seem to remember more. Lishi welled, Bud shouted, garbled and wet. Too young to even crawl, I could swear I remember running past folded arms and hiding beneath one of Lishi's special quilts until a new sun rose and all I could smell was coffee. I awoke to find Lishi had curled herself around me, indistinguishable from her homespun patchwork. That's the impossible memory I've crafted. No amount of time visiting Bud's house changed that. I wonder if the bones of my father are exposed and clean now. I picture a perfect white skeleton, fully intact, framed within the pine coffin, like the one I saw in anatomy class, so perfectly preserved the bones could teach. I know it sounds odd to speak of my father like that, but you have to understand, I never knew him in the flesh. I never felt the breath of his lungs. His memory is as much a skeleton as his body. Yet Lishi was always present. It was as if she radiated, sometimes even radiated right through me. I remember walking in her door after I returned from junior college. I hadn't said a word and surely hadn't made up my mind if I was ever going back. She looked up from where she sat in the rocking chair, sighed a heavy sigh and let her hands fall from her quilting to rest in her lap. Oh, County, she whispered. That is all she said, but I knew she knew everything. She understood far more than even I did that how I was feeling and how I would come to feel. I knew then and there I wasn't going back because she knew it first. She wasn't judging me or even pitying me. She just stirred within me until it was all sorted out. Except for the valley and the land 
<clears throat> that began pimpling with impoverished storefronts. Cherokee was not the Cherokee of today. Cherokee was mud chinked log cabins buried into mountain hollers, surprising expanses of neat gardens, ro garden rows jutting across rare unwooded land at the end of a roughly carved dirt roads, half washed away in the spring and summer and impassable with snow in the winter. No matter where human life chose to carve its mark on the land, it did not stray far from water, creek, river, stream, or fall. Follow one and you will, would find Cherokee. You would find the smoke from wood stoves. You would find red clay ground and defined ginger dust coating the surface of life. And you could not find it directly from any highway. To trust a road is still a road when it looks like a creek is not and has never been for the tourist heart. Yet it is only that trust that will get you from a road sign to a home, or in my case, from Leashy's where I live to Bud's where I worked. And I th think that's my time, so I will stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, just my, it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm so touched by this, um, the identity rooted in place that applies to, to all, all three of these wonderful novels. And um, now if there are um, questions from, or comments from any of the participants or amongst ourselves here, we certainly welcome and entertain them. Okay, I don't see a, something in the chat box right now or the question box. One one thing that I that I thought and I'd like to ask each each of the the three women here is in your books there is a there is an absolute uh, very very native sense of what happened before the time of the of the story, who was there before the time of the story and then what what is what is going to be passed on in um, you know kind of a teaching and learning from the story what goes on to the next generations that there is there is reason and purpose and I'm wondering if if each of you three could comment on that you know really specifically with your book sure I can I can try to start us off um, there was um, talk at different points in the editing process because I had this um, collection of stories I'd been writing. Um, I had stories that, that started, you know, right, right now the book starts when Justine um, is 15. Um, I had story, stories that went back to when she was 11. Um, I had a story at one point, there was a prologue when the great grandmother was a child um, being picked up with her little sister at an Indian orphanage. Um, so there, there was question of like how, how to focus this book. Um, and at one point it was definitely, you know, suggested that maybe it really was, was Justine and Rini's story. And, and in a sense it is, I think that they're really at, you know, the main characters, but the more I thought about it, the more I, I understood that you can't tell Justine's story, for instance, um, without telling the story of her mother. And then you can't tell Rini's story without telling the story of her great grandmother, that these women were all connected. Um, and I think that that connection really is at the heart of the, the book. You know, the, it's, a, it's a book with great struggle and strife and, and disillusion. But ultimately these are women, I think that what is, to, to get to your question, what, what they are passing on to each other is this, this kind of ferocity in, the, in their love and commitment to, to, to carrying, to survive, making sure that the next generations don't just survive, but they're, they're lifted up and they're doing that in the best way that they can. They're not always, you know, sometimes they butt heads over it, but, but I think at the heart is this connection through the generations. And even as the two youngest generations leave the Cherokee nation, they keep returning, they're going back and they're going back and they're carrying one another with them wherever they go, ultimately, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I really um, resonate with the description of your book, Kelly, the way that you're telling four generations. Um, and, you know, in my own novel, it's it, uh, I 
it's it's somewhere around that same. It's a generational novel told through four different voices, two two of whom are contemporary time, but then stretching back to the 1862 Dakota War, um, and and it was it was a the question I was trying to explore through their different stories is to look at the way the the women the Dakota women took care of their seeds and their families and their their food and how that work was so much a part of who they were as Dakota people because it's all about knowing the place where you live and having that that close relationship with the plants and the animals and the season so that you can survive because you know Minnesota it's a challenge I, I every year I just wonder how did they do it <laughs> um, when it's 30 below and so that uh, that idea of that commitment, that that in that incredible skill and understanding of the place where you live, and then we come forward in time to Rosalie, who because of um, the way that Im assimilation has impacted their family, is now down to the thinnest thread of connection to who she is, and and the and the that legacy of her her grandmothers, and I think. When you get to that point, and this is not an uncommon story these days when the language has been displaced and so much of our knowledge around foods, um, that, that what happens then? Can you find your way back? Can, and how would you do it? And so that to me was a really important theme, that intergenerational sharing, and that even when you've reached that furthest out edge of assimilation, that there is always something that can bring you home. And that in this story, it was the seeds, you know, that work in companionship with the this this family to bring them home. So, uh, great question, Linda. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, um, when I think about um, the generations that are discussed throughout the narrative, even though I have you know one narrative narrator um, throughout the whole novel. Um, we hear all the way, actually, we hear stories all the way back to removal um, period. Um, and then it's, it's a retrospective narrative where he is telling the story really to another generation. Um, I wanted to, to think about family in a different way, um, as opposed to how we track family through blood relation, but uh, instead look at it in terms of our relationships that we build um, within our communities. So for example, um, Lishi, his grandmother is actually his um, paternal grandmother, but the word Lishi in Cherokee means maternal grandmother. And so um, she had just served that maternal role for him uh, to help raise him. And she, so um, by playing that role, she kind of earned that name. Um, and then County, not to give anything else away, but grapples with who is playing what role in his familial life. And I think that that's so connected to the stories we tell about, you know, who our people are, um, who our family is, is less about, um, you know, the the blood uh, line that, that we, um, typically identify people by, but more so the, the relationships um, that we've played in each other's lives over centuries. You know, I think about you know, what Kelly Jo was talking about um, as a soulmate, her great grandmother, I believe is what she said. Um, you know, I, I would imagine um, it doesn't mean that that's the person that she spent um, the majority of her life with. Um, but there's a special connection there that, that, that makes her closer. So I, you know, that's kind of what I was getting at <clears throat> with, um, with the perspectives kind of going across the years and even as we breathe. Thank you. Um, there is a question here. It's, it's for everyone. How difficult is it to research your, tropic or your topics with the tribes? I'll, I'll just keep talking since I was, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it's not hard at all for me um, because I lived here. So I lived in the place that I, I was writing about. 
even though it is historical, I felt like I had access to that historical uh, information. Specifically, I used a lot of pictures um, to think about landscape. There's not a lot, there are not a lot of records um, as to what was happening at the Grove Park, for example. Um, but because I was living in the community that, that I was writing about, um, I, know, I know the people that I need to talk to for historical information. I know where the records are. Um, it made it really easy for me. So I got off easy. <laughs> okay. um, I, I actually have been very fortunate that for the past 15 years, I've been working in food sovereignty with two different native organizations, both of which um, are very much engaged in uh, seed work. So I got to learn my seed work firsthand. And, and actually, because I showed up as a volunteer, I, I learned it from the ground up and started just with you know, weeding, where we all start as volunteers, and then you know grew up in these organizations to then become the director. So I feel really blessed that so much of the, uh, the knowledge that I brought into the, the novel was from the elders that I worked with, from the communities, uh, from the programs that we had. Uh, a lot of my work has been in an urban setting in Minneapolis where we work with a lot of different tribes, but um, it's been that opportunity to work firsthand with those seeds and to, to really understand that relationship from, um, from a native perspective that informed my book. Thanks, y'all. Um... You know, for me, the research was really kind of about things from from the periods I was was writing about. Um, and and like Annette, I <laughs> I didn't realize I was writing about writing historical fiction until I was invited later. Even in the process, I was invited to the history book festival. I was like, history book? I was writing about the eighties, the seventies. Oh, you know, right? But I guess I guess so. But so. Um, you know, Crooked Hallelujah for me is a really, really personal book. It's not strictly autobiographical, um, but it's very much in ways, you know, it's definitely inspired by, I like Rini, when I was, um, when I was very little, I lived in a household of four generations and I slept with my great grandmother and my mom was really young. I mean, my mom was 16 when she had me. Um, and so, my mom and her sisters and different cousins were in and out, my grandmother and my great grandmother. So I grew up in this household of um, really strong, funny, um, tight women. And, and we were, when I was little, you know, we were holiness Pentecostal. So I was really just drawing kind of from personal experience of, of family stories and growing up on a pallet underneath a pew and a tambourine, tambourine banging kind of shout your bun down kind of church. So I wasn't researching a lot. It, I was pulling a lot from within, um, but you know, reach out and talk to talk to people, aunts, my mom, ask ask questions, stories. Um, we go home and ask my grandmother stories, but um, she didn't. She doesn't really remember a lot. Um, but you know, I have family journals and things like that, which is such a blessing. Um, my computer sits on one thing to raise it up is my grandmother's um, and my great uncle's, it was all, her brother shared it as well. Um, this wooden folder, it, it's like a trapper keeper, but it's it's made out of wood and it's from the forties and it's notes from when they were at Shilako Indian school. So it just feels like it, the, the research is just kind of really close. It's just a matter of gathering and spending time with it for me. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, would like to ask another question too. I was struck by um, Annette's phrase about identity rooted in place, which is uh, present, you know, it's a thread running through all, all of these stories. And I'm wondering if you could each comment on that a little bit. I know we still have about seven minutes left, so there's room to do this. Um, can, you, can you link, you know, certainly link that into your own, your own stories here? Um, so I'll just jump in. Um, my story is rooted in uh, the south central part of Minnesota, which, um, and I've lived in Minnesota all my life. So that idea of 
<clears throat> excuse me, really understanding where you live and in terms of the seasons and the impact on, um, I, I look at it from that, that relationship with plants and animals and water and, and how that becomes your food and that in a traditional diet um, that you would have needed that really sophisticated understanding of what was available when and that your survival uh, depended on your relationship with that place. And so by focusing on seeds and then, you know, that relationship to land, it's a way of um, looking at how it's changed and evolved, but remains present in uh, as a as a really fundamental part of uh, Native people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I'll just kind of uh, jump on from there because I, I appreciate what Diane says about um, you know, this need to survive from the land from, from the earliest point um, and how that has also evolved to a protection of those um, sources. So, so knowing um, that that the future is unidentified right now and and we know that we've survived um, on this land for so long and that we have to continue to protect those sources uh, resources um, even if we don't know exactly why in the moment right that that there may be a future reason um, for it that hasn't been identified yet so um I've had this conversation with a lot of people who around these stereotypes of, of native characters communing with the land in some kind of magical way, right? Um, and it's something I like to play with in my writing to take the reader up to that edge, but to say, you know, we've, we've spent, you know, centuries protecting this land, living with this land. Of course, we know this land. Of course, we understand this land um, and all of its resources. It's nothing that's magical. It's something that um, as human beings existing on this planet, it's essential um, in, in order to, to be in community with, with our surroundings. So, um, you know, and I think that just when you think about what you value, that is who you are, that is your identity when you identify your values like that. Mm -hmm. That's really, really powerful, um, Annette and Diane. That's um, really moving. Um, Feel, feel ready to get outside right now, um, take it all in. Um, there's something that um, Lula, who is the grandmother character in uh, Cricket Hallelujah does, and she paints landscapes of Sequoia County. Um, she paints other things too, but one thing that her daughter, Justine, cannot get understand really is, is why she sees so much beauty in Sequoia County and loves it so much, loves the land and the hills. And, you know, there's a line that's like, you know, she, she doesn't understand how, where, why she sees so much beauty in these scrubby hills. And I think that's, you know, I, I my own grandmother very much, she loves Sequoia County um, was so much that even though her daughters left, she, she would never like she insisted on staying even when she couldn't care for herself and she would she would rather go into a home there than go and live with her daughters who would very much love for her to come in a different state but she says that she was born in sequoia county and that's where she's gonna die and that's something that i think um you know so having um a, one of the younger generations not understand her love of that place is something that I think just comes from um, our family grappling with trying to understand it. And it's something that, um, you know, as, as a citizen of the Cherokee Nations, um, an at-large citizen at that, um, you know, it's, it's only, I think, recently in thinking about the removal in a different way. Like, I think that I felt you know, great sorrow that, you know, like Annette and I didn't, aren't, aren't neighbors, you know, that, that you know, the removal made my family from Oklahoma. But I think that I've come to like realize recently that like, that's powerful. That's about survival. And of course, people like my grandmother who are born and insist on dying there, like 
of course they take great pride in it because it's not just about like a story of sorrow, right? It's much greater than that. Indeed. Um, yes, very be beautifully said. And thank you. Thank you so much for that. It is more than much more. Well, it's, it's time for us to wrap things up and many, many thanks to our speakers today and to everyone who is watching. Please consider buying these featured books from your local independent booksellers or using the, the link that's provided in the chat. And you can also check out our other events in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. And again, miigwech, thank you from the heart. Gigawabamen. Thank you, everyone.